I'm David Spears. Welcome to Insiders. Friday marked the sixth anniversary of the Uluru Statement, a landmark cry for voice, treaty and truth-telling. Architects of the statement returned to Uluru and delivered a back-to-basics reminder of what the voice is meant to be about, recognising and listening to Indigenous Australians. In Parliament, however, the political divide deepened and the debate hardened. Peter Dutton is now throwing everything at the no case, arguing an Indigenous voice would racially divide Australians. Other Liberals echoed the line, but not all. Leading moderate Simon Birmingham refused to defend the comment, and two backbenchers rejected the argument entirely. Later in the program, I'll speak to Independent Senator Lydia Thorpe, who's calling for the Constitution to include a specific acknowledgement of the sovereignty of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people. First, the panel, Dan Borsha, Karen Middleton and Cameron Stewart. Uh, so, Karen, to you first. Peter Dutton, we know, spent about 10 months or so weighing his position on whether to support a constitutionally enshrined voice. He's yes. now opposed, and during the week we saw in that speech he gave, he's really strengthened that argument. Mm -hmm. Why uh, has he gone there, do you think? Well, I think he holds the view that it could be divisive and he's using very strong language. I mean, he talked about it, the potential for it to re-racialise Australia. Um, I mean, there's plenty of people who've argued, and I've argued, that the country is divided now already uh, racially. Talk to Indigenous people and that's what they'll tell you. So I think we're already divided. I think the risk here, though, is when you are talking about these kinds of issues, you have to be very careful that in raising issues of concern about division, you are not just fueling division. And that is the accusation that I think is being made, and including from some on his own side, that, that he's not treading carefully enough on this in this debate. And he, ha he runs the risk, either accidentally or not accidentally, of inflaming further division. Yeah, and I want to get to how the Liberals themselves are dealing with where he's gone, or taken this argument. But, Dan, let's just unpack the allegation, the suggestion there that this is to use the opposition leader's words, re-racialise the nation. Mm. I mean, the proposal would give Indigenous Australians um, the ability to vote for an advisory body specifically for uh, advocating for Indigenous Australians and their wellbeing. Does that mean they have additional rights or privileges above non-Indigenous Australians? Well, that's certainly the point that I think the Liberal leader made in Parliament quite forcefully, as, as Karen was saying, this week. Uh, but it also insinuates or implies that the government would have to take on any advice that's made by representations made from this group, which we know won't be the case. It won't have the veto power, that it wouldn't have the ability to be a halt on that decision making, that it would be another voice bringing into it. And it also misses that we've seen a number of the courts making decisions that do go to the different place that Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people have in Australia about that special place, one of those court, high court cases said. So there is already a difference. And if you look at the wording of our constitution, there are already differences that race is a part of our constitution. And you don't need to be sitting in Parliament to be looking at racialise, how racialised our nation is now. You need to go on social media or step outside of your, whatever building you're in, because right now we are facing an existential threat of the, the divides within race in Australia, and we're seeing that everywhere. Yeah, and I do want to get to uh, Stan Grant in a moment as well, but, uh, Cam, this, this argument... I mean, we've heard from the, the Nationals for a while now, the argument about racial division through the voice and so on, but for Peter Dutton... Uh, as, as the Liberal leader to go there. I, su I suppose it does give the green light to other li Liberals uh, to make that case as well. Are there risks and dangers in going down that path, do you think? There really are. I mean, uh, to some degree, because I mean, you've got, you saw how Simon Birmingham, how uncomfortable he was. Mm -hmm. It's going to make um, whatever moderates are remain in the Liberal Party very uncomfortable, I think. I mean, Peter Dutton really just turned the volume up so much this week, didn't he? I mean, he was previously... Um, opposing on the basis that it might be open to a legal challenge or it might mm -hmm. slow down the mechanism of government. But, you know, as Karen said, re-racialising, Orwellian, that sort of language. I mean, he's clearly decided to dig his trench right here and that's going to be the position from which he's going to fight this battle. And it's uncomfortable for the moderates, but, you know, the moderates have been um, carved out of the Liberal Party because of the teals over the last election. So well, that's you, do, it, yeah. you do wonder... Uh, it's a much more right-wing Liberal Party than we've seen previously. So he'll probably be able to hold the position, I think. Yeah, well, let's just uh, explore that. I, th I think it's fair to say that the overwhelming majority of the Liberals there in Canberra at the moment, uh, in the Parliament, um, uh, are with Peter Dutton in opposing the voice. There are uh, a small number who are publicly still supporting uh, the voice, and they include 
Julian Lisa, who was the Shadow Minister, stood down from the Shadow Ministry over, the, over this issue. Um, and he, in his speech in Parliament, really um, uh, went straight to this argument about whether it's going to give some more rights than others. Some say the voice will give Indigenous Australians a place of privilege. Does anyone really believe that Indigenous Australians occupy a place of privilege? Because if they do, let them go to Laverton and Leonora, let them go to Sedun, let them go to Palm Island, let them go to Arakoon, let them go to Alice Springs. And then there are those who are remaining on the front bench, leading moderates like Simon Birmingham, because he's staying on the front bench, he's bound by the position to oppose the voice. But clearly, you can see here, struggling to defend his leader's language. Will it re-racialise Australia? No, I, I'm not going to spend my time between now and the referendum uh, commenting on the comments of uh, It's of your the leader, players. though. He's your leader. And he says it will re-racialise Australia. Do you agree with him? Patricia and I have uh, outlined uh, the approach I'm taking to this referendum and the campaign, and that's the approach I'm going to stick to. I mean, Karen, you know, and I've spoken to other uh, senior figures in the shadow ministry who similarly don't want to use that line that Peter Dutton's using. But can they, I mean, how awkward will this be for the next four or five months for them, right? They can't just take a back seat and ignore this debate. It's super awkward. And this is the problem they all face. And perhaps no, no one more than Simon Birmingham, who really is the leading moderate on the front bench now, is trying to walk that line. And Peter Dutton knows that in the decision that he's made. He knows it's putting mm. his more moderate colleagues in a difficult position. He's rolling the dice and digging the trenches, Cam mm. said. He's made a decision. He's prepared to do that. He's talking about unifying his party, but it's quite clear that this position will not be unifying his party. But his decision is that it's a risk worth taking because he thinks he can prevail, and it does put them in a super difficult spot. They can, in the privacy of the ballot box, uh, at the, later on in the year, vote whatever way they like. But in Parliament, they will have on this legislation that they're currently dealing with, they'll have to vote with... And that'll them. be recorded for every, yeah, I mean, every member and senator. Yeah, of course, front benches don't have the same liberty that back benches have to cross the floor. Front benches are expected to toe the party line. So those are Liberal, senior Liberals, including Simon Birmingham, and he, and he squirmed, I think, when you interviewed him recently on that yeah, point. Yeah, last we're going to show He it, yeah. clearly will have to vote at least with, on the with a position that he doesn't support. At least on the legislation. This is the legislation to yeah. have the referendum. Yeah. The, Peter Dutton said in his speech they're going to vote for it to, to let people have their say. The Nationals, however, will vote against it, yes. uh, which is just an interesting distinction. Um, they need some to vote no to write the official pamphlet. The but no they, pamphlet. they took a no position before we knew anything about yeah, anything. Yeah. That they were no from the start. And, and of course the Prime Minister has, has dug his own trench mm. this week to a degree as well by, by saying the wording will be exactly what it's going to be. We're not going to have a compromise. We're not going to go down the road of maybe exercising executive government as a, a compromise. So you've really got both sides uh, you know, digging d in. Dug in. And it's interesting with all the issue of um, you know, what tinderbox racial debate is in this country at the moment with the Stan Grant, the ABC issue. You know, the voice takes it to another level. And I think it's going to be a huge test of civility for politicians, for the parliament, for the media and the public to have this debate in some sort of civil nature. It's going to be a, absolutely a huge test. Linda Burney, um, as we saw back in Uluru the last uh, couple of days to mark that sixth anniversary of the Uluru Statement, um, we, we saw the Prime Minister say that Peter Dutton's language was unworthy of an alternative Prime Minister. I think Linda Burney, you can see, is, is really hoping that um, this debate can move away from the politicians and get back to that, that grassroots, uh, community-led uh, type of campaign. Peter Dutton is playing politics. This referendum will be determined by the Australian people, not politicians. And I have great faith in the Australian people. I have great faith in the Australian people. I mean, she's a politician too. I don't know if we can uh, you know, see the politics taken out of this uh, over the coming months. What about the Yes campaign though, Dan? How do you think it's going? Is it looking to try and get some fresh momentum and, and, and is that likely to come? Well, uh, first I want to just say I think it's hard to extract the politics out when we're talking about changing the constitution which sets up our body politics. <laughs> yeah. exactly. uh, and on the, on the point that Cam made on the test of civility, I'd have to say that we're failing it as a nation 
right now, which I know we're going to get to. As for the Yes campaign, I think that they're really quite concerned at the moment. That they're not taking one poll as gospel. However, when you're looking at the trend across mm. the board, and it was, it was said to me just this week that it seems those that have really decided what their position in are betting down. Those people that aren't sure are much more um, movable on that. And that's certainly the perspective I've been getting while I've been travelling around the country reporting this last couple of months, is that the people that know that they want this... Uh, dead set for this. Those that don't are very nervous about speaking publicly and then there's a big divide in the middle, a big gap in the middle of people that aren't sure yet. Because they don't know what it's about, is that the, the problem? I think that it's it's layered and nuanced so that there are those that say this is not treaty, it's not sovereignty. There are those, in, in fact Bundjalung lawyer uh, Vanessa Turnbull Roberts said this week on the drum that there are those who are for it, there are those that are against and then there's the racist no campaign. There's also a lot more in the middle, those that are know that say they don't trust government, that they're not sure about the process that led to this. There's a lot of layers here and that's the nuance I think that is being lost in the, in the public debate when we hear politicians you know, invoking or Orwellian changes or yeah. re-racialising. Well, yeah, Karen, what about all the, was it 20 sporting organisations yesterday had full page ads in the uh, weekend papers and so on. Does, does that sort of institutional backing, the churches, uh, does all of this help the it's Yes hard campaign? To, it's hard to know. I guess those Yes campaigners who have solicited the support believe that it's helpful. Mm. There's a question of the timing of that support too and whether it's too early, whether it's better to come later. I mean, there's a sort of an arc of, of a de campaign like this and you want it, if you're an advocate for Yes, you want it to land, mm. gain its I'm most told, momentum. They, they say to me that they're not really going to get into full gear until the parliamentary process is done at the end of... Yeah, yeah. but I think the, the, cha the big challenge for the Yes side in any referendum like this is they have to do more convincing. They, they're the ones who have to lock people into a position where they're prepared to go into the ballot box that I talked about before and, and mark Yes. What the no side has to do, all they have to do, and I think it was interesting, um, Greg Craven, who had raised legal concerns about this prior to seeing the Solicitor General's advice and now says, and he's a law professor, now says he's satisfied and he will be voting yes. He, he said recently the one job that the no campaign has to do is sow confusion and uncertainty. Mm. And, you know, it, it, in some ways they're doing well enough if, exactly. if, if the uncertainty section of that, of that poll um, yeah. remains high. Because if you're uncertain, you're not convinced mm -hmm. enough and you're more likely to vote no. And so they will be sowing confusion, um, uncertainty, throwing out whatever they can find to make people just hesitate enough not to be quite willing to vote I yes. Think the yes campaign is well behind where it needs to be because um, the polls have come out lately. Uh, there was a recent poll of people who were inclined to vote no and the main reason they, they gave was they didn't have the details. There's a massive education campaign. I think the yes, the yes campaign is going to have to go to right now because the polls are falling and unless they do it, I think they'll, they'll lose. And yep. I think on the, yeah. on the detail yeah. is really interesting. That's emerged again this week from Peter Dutton that there's not the detail out there, which seems like it was settled earlier in this year but has, has re-emerged. So I suspect that's going to be one of the big no campaign strategies. Yeah, if you keep telling people there's no detail, they think, oh, yeah, yeah well, where is what the is the detail? I don't, yeah. What detail? Do, what do I not know? Yeah. Which goes to the confusion. Yeah. Now, um, I, I do want to acknowledge uh, and just touch on the, the words and actions of our colleague Stan Grant. Um, his words are always powerful, they're always worth considering and, and those remarks that he made on Monday night uh, at the end of the Q&A program where he said, look, he's not stepping away because of the racist abuse or because of the social media trolling, but because he needs to ask whether the media itself is part of the problem. Um, I know there's been a lot of finger pointing during the week about, you know, who's to blame for all of this and um, ABC management have offered apologies for not standing up for him and so on. But it, 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 what Stan says, Dan, is that we all need to reflect a little bit on uh, our own roles in this ecosystem. Uh, and I think that's a very valid point, isn't it? Oh, absolutely it is. I don't think we need to be pointing fingers. We need to be holding up a mirror and asking ourselves, what are we doing and what have we said or not said in supporting people or shutting down when, when there is misinformation or when there are really targeted abuse that Stan and his family have been... Uh, sustaining for many, many years, but it has certainly heightened recently. He was in Canberra at a book tour just this week mm. and he said he spoke about the death threats that they routinely get, the him and his family. And I think that the fact that, that someone can be screamed off, off a, a primetime program 
uh, and shut down and made to feel as though they can't go on needs to raise serious alarm bells. And, and you're right that there have been many questions asked about the ABC and about management and what they should have done. And, and they've called a review that full disclosure is something that I had called for and yep. said that needs to be independent, transparent and to look at understanding what's happening and why. But this is not just for the ABC. This is something that contemporary media in Australia needs to reflect very deeply on. And I think that we also need to be having a very honest conversation about where social media fits in that, because it's not all of the problem, but it certainly is part of the problem. Yeah, and look, I don't think you know, any of us can pretend to have the perfect answer no. to any, you know, as much as um, people might suggest they do, I think you know, we all need to have a look at um, you know, how we're operating and where we can do better. But Dan, I did want to, you know, we spoke about this earlier, so I wanted to give you an opportunity just to explain to people what it's like for you mm. um, going through the last week or so an, an Indigenous journalist at the ABC, what you have to deal with and what the impact is of, of seeing Stan go through this. Well, Stan's been a mentor and friend of mine. So I've taken... It's been quite personal. It's felt really personal. And it's reminded me of things that I thought that I'd dealt with about the abuse, the death threats, the the constant belittling and, or degrading of, of what your perspective is that happens from some in the community. It's also raised lots of issues about what happens within the ABC and there's been a lot of reporting about that and, and I have to say that not much of that has surprised me because it's what I hear and it's, some of it is what I've experienced myself. And so I think... You're that, talking about racism? Yeah. Yeah. In the organisation? Well, yeah, when I come on this program and, and am dismissed as, as your diversity pick or your box ticker, you know, that comes from within our organisation and then that sends a message that that type of language is normal and it, it's not it's unacceptable yeah, and it is unacceptable and, and it's not why you're here for the record we love your well, I, would, I, would, but, I would hope not but it's yeah. why initially I said no to coming on mm. this program it's why I've said no to other programs because why would I subject myself and even more difficult why would I put my partner and our family in into yeah. that you know that that level of criticism Mm. I think it's easy, though, for David, for those of us from an Anglo background who don't get this experience, yeah. to, to not notice it. Yep. We don't see it. We don't know it's happening. We don't experience it. And people who suffer from it, um, whatever race, and particularly Indigenous people, but people of all different races in this country, don't go around talking about it. They just try and get on with things. But it happens all the time, every day, in tiny, tiny ways and gigantic ways. Yeah, and yeah. it, it's not a bad thing for those of us who don't experience it to hear about it and have a perspective on it and understand that, you know, life is, is quite challenging sometimes when you're constantly being, you know, snide remarks or, or really more direct mm. and violent remarks are, are part of your everyday existence. It's, a, it's an element of life in a public job in particular, but just life in the community yeah. that, that some of us never, ever get to see and experience. And we don't often hear perspectives like, like Dan's then, you know, I think it's really important to hear that. Yeah, sort of <laughs> it is. No, it's also. tough. Like this is, you know, this is a tough conversation. We're having yep. a reckoning in Australia right now, and as tough as this is, we can't turn away from this. This is th that moment in time where we can actually mm. stop and say, right, w what is going on here, and how do we deal with this? And and that doesn't mean that we're not above scrutiny, which it, w it will be the immediate criticism of me. Sure, scrutinise what I have to say and critique my perspective. But it's when it trips over to becoming very personal and targeted that we, we know we have a problem. Yeah, indeed. Well said. Uh, let's move on. Time to talk to Jabwarang Gunai Gunditch Mara woman and independent Senator Lydia Thorpe. And to take us there, he was the opposition leader on why he thinks the voice should not be added to the Constitution. Nowhere else in the world is there a success story like ours. One of Indigenous heritage of British inheritance and migration and multicultural success. Three threads woven together brilliantly and harmoniously. Our nation works and our democratic system works. By and large, Australians are pleased with their constitution, which has served them well. Our constitution is not something to be toyed with lightly. Yet that's exactly what this Prime Minister is doing. Senator, welcome to the program. Thanks for having me. So let's just clear this up at the start. Are you going to join with Peter Dutton in voting no? Definitely not. Definitely not. Definitely so anyone not. who suggests you're in the no camp, 
I'm not in the no camp. I've never been in the no camp and my position has been clear all along and that is that we need a treaty in this country. So what's your position then on the question that's before, or what's going to be before all Australians on The Voice itself? You're not voting no, will you vote yes? Well, the yes vote is to uh, allow for a powerless voice uh, to go into the Constitution. Yes, we don't know what this looks like. It could be one person. It's up to the Parliament to decide what the voice looks like. So uh, I can't support something that gives us no power uh, and I certainly cannot support a no campaign that is looking more like a white supremacy campaign that is causing a lot of harm. So I will, uh, I'm considering to abstain uh, from the up and coming vote given uh, our people want a treaty, we want the recommendations implemented for the Royal Commission into Aboriginal Deaths in Custody. Uh, we have incarceration rates going out of control uh, and we have over 22,000 Aboriginal children in out-of-home care today. That is the priority that this country should be talking about uh, and the government have an opportunity to show good faith and implement those recommendations. They might get my vote if they do that. I'll come back to that. Just to clear up, though, when you talk about abstaining on the vote, there are, there are two votes, I suppose, for you. There's the one in the Senate uh, next month on the legislation, the Constitution Alteration Bill, to have the referendum. Then there's the vote that you and every Australian will have in the referendum. Um, let's just be clear about it. Are you saying you'll abstain on the vote in the Senate? I am considering abstaining on the vote in the Senate. I do have an amendment that I will be proposing, which is about acknowledging the sovereign status of First Nations peoples in this country. Uh, and I'm still in negotiation with the government on uh, implementing national recommendations that will save people's lives today. Uh, it's been difficult to get meetings with the Minister herself and the Attorney General. And didn't, they... you, didn't you meet with her last week? I did, but that was after five months of waiting. Uh, and the door has not been open for myself or the black sovereign movement in this country. And I think that's part of the, the problem. OK, but if, if you're going to abstain on the vote next, uh, next month in the Senate, um, do you think people might think, well, hang on, your, your, your main reason for being in Parliament is to advance the rights and wellbeing of Indigenous Australians. It's a pretty big issue. Are you sitting on the fence? Why can't you make a decision to vote yes or no? Because neither of them are going to change anything in this country. They're not going to change the reality of what is going on in this country right now. We had a suicide of a young man this week. Uh, the incarceration rates, as I say, are happening every day in this country. And are you saying your voice pressing... would, would, would not help at all? Well, the voice is going to be decided by parliamentarians on who it is, what it is, what it looks like, what it does, that is no power to the people. We need to start discussing sovereignty in this country that will ultimately bring power to First Nations people, which is what my amendment talks about. But isn't the idea of the voice, yes, Parliament would decide its structure, but it would be Indigenous Australians who decide who is on the voice? Uh, that's not specified in any of the detail. And if we look at what, uh, say, Megan Davis said at the National Press Club, is that they banned legitimate senior Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander leaders who were questioning the, the whole constitutional recognition reform. Uh, they've excluded those voices for six years, David. Uh, so I can't support something that has not had the free, prior and informed consent and full, genuine consultation of the people, Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people, who this will ultimately affect. Uh, and I won't be sitting with racist and white supremacy on the no. So I, as I said, I've been clear, my position is treaty and I will continue to negotiate with the government to implement recommendations if they do that, show us some good faith. Just show us some good faith. They've been in power before. They could have implemented the recommendations back then. Uh, and we know that Hawke and Keating want a treaty. So why, why is this government following on from the, the coalition government's well, their, policy? Their argument on that is that you need a voice first 
who is the government going to take advice from if there's no voice on things like treaty and truth telling? They have voices. They just haven't been listening. This government is who, so... Who should they talk to about treaty? Well, they should talk to the many uh, clans and nations that are going through processes now, but also having an understanding of what that looks like. It should look like peace in communities. It should be open to all Australians in this country to have a conversation in their local communities about what coming together looks like, what peace looks like. The treaties around the world um, take years and years and years to negotiate. And as you say, there are many clans who would be involved. There are many um, groups who would want to be involved here. Wouldn't a voice help to coordinate, to advise the government at least on the best approach? Well, we don't know. As I said, the, the government could pick Noel Pearson as the voice and the one and only voice. Let's be there real. There are that's, concerns about what the voice... You know not going to be a, a one-person voice. No one has suggested Well, that. it's a one... It seems that this whole campaign has come from a Pearson quite conservative idea from many, many years ago. They've been pushing this for a number of years as, as a conservative idea. But it is now, disingenuous calling... to say that it would be a one-person voice. Well, is it? You know, uh, we haven't, we, we don't have any idea of what or how they're going to select or um, go through a process to decide who, which Aboriginal people or Torres Strait Islander people they're going to pick for this job, just like they've handpicked all of their uh, referendum uh, advisers. And that's, that's part of the the process that's gone wrong. They've excluded too many grassroots sovereign blackfellas around the country uh, and they're the people who are the progressive no's and they're the people who've got concerns about cessation of sovereignty. When you talk about sovereignty, I'm just um, interested in you sort of explaining what you're talking about there because it, it's a word that can mean different things to, to different people. The amendment you, you flagged that you're going to be um, moving on the legislation in the Senate, it does talk about uh, the right of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples to exercise an unimpeded and collective self-determinant governance over their political, economic and social affairs. What would that sort of sovereignty look like in practice? That would look like negotiating with the Crown on uh, things like resources, things like land, uh, things like possibly reparations and, and land rights, land back. We've had so much taken from us over the last 200 years. That's why we have the rates that we're dealing with today. That's why we have a stolen generation uh, deaths in custody, incarceration rates, is because we've, you know, our cries have fallen on deaf ears through successive governments. A voice uh, may give advice to the parliament. Well, may is, is not good enough as far as we're concerned. Uh, and we want real power. We want to be acknowledged as sovereigns in this country uh, just as the, the Crown is acknowledged as, as a sovereign. The, the Attorney-General, uh, on behalf of the government, has said there's nothing in the proposed um, voice uh, amendment to the Constitution that would impede sovereignty, that would undermine sovereignty. The expert working group of constitutional experts have said the same. Mm. What is it in, in this proposal that you think would have anything to do with undermining sovereignty? Uh, well, the very fact that you know, the Australian Constitution hasn't been here for very long uh, compared to First Nations peoples. We've been here for thousands and thousands mm -hmm. of generations. So uh, our Constitution is the oldest Constitution on the planet and that comes with caring for country, caring for one another, caring for our totems. Those responsibilities, responsibilities we take very seriously and we have a law of the land. So to then have a constitution rock on 200 years ago or in nine, since 1901 to say, well, this is a new law of the land, we need to be acknowledged as sovereign people as part of the so-called founding document. But my question was, what does the Indigenous, putting an Indigenous voice in the constitution do that's going to undermine that cause? 
Without acknowledging our sovereignty, which I know the AG has said it doesn't uh, undermine or uh, the experts in that field, but they're basing it on a colonial system. They're basing it on their training as lawyers within the legal colonial system. So do you have a different legal view on this? Our, our view is from the United Nations Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous People and our rights to self-determine our own political structures, our own uh, economic base and have real power for us mm. to self-determine our own destiny to go forward. I, I understand your point on that but again does the putting the voice in the Constitution make that harder? Uh, it, it may. It depends uh, who they choose as the voice and remembering that they have no power. They can come up with a good idea uh, and the likes of Pauline Hanson will say, oh, don't like that idea and uh, it, it doesn't go anywhere. So it's not going to be taken seriously. Uh, and we need real power. We need a treaty. We need truth telling so that we can eradicate the racism that we're dealing with in this country. People don't understand the true history of this nation. You only need to look at sky after dark. They have no idea. So that's the stuff we need to eradicate for us to come together for uh, the good of this nation and to mature as a nation. And the only mechanism to do that is a treaty. Just before we leave this whole issue, do you think by not supporting yes, you are helping the no campaign? Not at all. I've been very clear that I will continue to fight for justice, continue to fight for treaty, uh, and I think the yes and no campaign are, uh, are very different, obviously, uh, and I don't subscribe to either side. So you, you, you'll, you're thinking about it sounds like you will um, abstain on the Senate vote? And then in the referendum later in the year, what will you do? Depends what Labor comes good with. You know, they're waving our black flag, implement the uh, Royal Commission into deaths in custody. You have the time to do that before the referendum. You have time to implement the Bringing Them Home report, uh, which we looked at yesterday on Sorry Day, while they're celebrating at Uluru. I mean, if that's any... Uh, indication of what Labor uh, think about stolen generations and child removal, then we have a long way to go. Just before I let you go, you also during the week uh, had a go at your former Greens colleague Sarah Hanson-Young. You suggested that she failed to stand up against racism in the party that was directed towards you. Sarah Hanson-Young has rejected that accusation. What were you talking about there? Well, unfortunately, David, I can't comment on that because I have been advised by my lawyers that it does need to be sent to the Human Rights and Equal Opportunity Commission. There is enough grounds for a case and I have to leave it there. So you are lodging a case about this? I am. In relation to your former party colleagues? Uh, I'll leave that up to uh, my lawyers and, and the Human Rights uh, Commission to... That's a conversation I need to have with them. I don't want to right. say any further, but yes, I've been, I've experienced racism all my life in every workplace and the Greens were no different. All right. And what are you seeking through this sort of case? I, I just want racism stamped out. We see, you know, the ABC, it's, it's called institutional racism. It's the, it's the foundation of these institutions that are racist, that allow racism to occur. I think we all need to look at ourselves within uh, and, and eradicate that and make our workplaces safer. Senator Lydia Thorpe, thanks for joining us this morning. Thank you. All right, let's get back to our panel. We're joined once again by Dan Borsha, Karen Middleton, Cameron Stewart. Uh, let's just quickly pick up on that um, a little bit there. Karen, the position from the Senator on the vote in the Senate to abstain and by the sounds of it when it comes to the referendum vote later in the year uh, you know still very um, very unclear as to whether she would she would actually vote for it she's not going to vote against it though that's that's one thing she's definitely clear no, it's interesting that the senator was laying down some conditions there for the government saying you know her mind is open if they can do more on implementing the deaths in custody royal commission recommendations and the like so that that'll be interesting to watch um, and she's trying to make an argument that she doesn't want to vote no because she doesn't like the way the no the public campaign is being run, mm. um, but she's not going to vote yes. And I think the difficulty for people in that position is that not voting yes is 
is supporting no, because it's supporting the status quo, which is no. So that's the difficulty that that um, the senator will have and, and that those that um, hold her views that, mm. and, and, you know, we have some people advocating no who say that the voice is going too far and it's dangerous. We have other people like the senator advocating the status quo because they say it doesn't go far enough and they want a treaty. Um, anyone who's not saying yes is effectively accepting the status quo. Well, that's what I put to her. She, she um, disputed no. that, but uh, yeah. if you basically but that's the practical the impact, quo. isn't it? If you're not if you're not voting yes, then abstaining is allowing the status quo. Just on these reports that we've heard, which is a legitimate position. Yeah, L Lydia Thorpe has long made the point that, that more needs to be done on the recommendations from the 1991 Royal Commission uh, on deaths in custody and the bringing them home report as well. There were, I think, 339 recommendations from the Royal Commission, 54 from the bringing them home report, and a lot of them, um, I think most of them, have not been implemented. But Dan. The problem for the federal government is a lot of those recommendations go to state and territory governments. They also go to ATSIC, which is yeah. no longer there. Yeah, that's right. So I think what would have to happen is you'd have to go through all those recommendations from those two reports uh, in particular, and probably also some coronial inquests that have followed through uh, after those reports and see which are still fit for purpose and which need to uh, be re-looked at. And given that we have now this national cabinet where the leaders are coming together, I would suggest that that would probably be a place to come together and say, right, here's the suite of recommendations, here's the ones that, that would still apply or, or others that perhaps need some work. Because on that point about the deaths in custody, we know that the situation has actually got worse since that report came out 30 odd years ago. And, and that because many of the, well, it's often said that it's because many of those recommendations weren't enacted in the prisons, in the judicial system, in the uh, systems that lead into that, which is the very conversation that we're having nationally right now. Let's move on to a couple of other things. Um, electricity prices are going up, uh, and we saw this uh, a feature in Parliament uh, during the week. Not surprisingly, the regulator has confirmed the increase from July up to 25% for households, up to 29% for small businesses, and cue the, the political blame game. The Prime Minister lied at the last election. Let, let's be very clear about it. He promised on 97 occasions that your bill would go down by $275. Now, if Peter had had it his way, we'd be looking at energy bills 50% uh, higher because that's what the energy regulator was saying at the end of last okay. year. So both sides having a go at each other. Uh, government put these caps in place uh, that the opposition didn't support to keep down the pressure on prices. But Labor did promise before the election that there would be a drop rather than an increase. Um, Cam, how vulnerable do you think the government is on this one? Look, I mean, the big picture is the prices are going up for a range of reasons. Fundamentally, they're going up because of Russia's invasion of Ukraine and the sanctions put on Russia. Uh, we have inflation as well. Um, but, you know, the, and the government makes the argument that with the, with the caps they've put, it would have been much worse. But I think that it will hurt the government uh, to the extent that this was flagged, this rise was actually flagged in March. Mm. But, you know, most mums and dads don't really look at this. I mean, you know, understandably... Not they, until you they, get that bill. They just see the yeah. bill. They see the bill. And they see a bill that's, um, what, three to four times the size of inflation mm. on top of other inflationary pressures. I mean, I think it just does hurt the government. Uh, I think that the question of blame is, is a far more difficult um, thing to apportion. Mm. But I think it does hurt them. I think the trap the government's in here, David, is that it, it's um, trying to make a slightly complicated argument now, which is that the bills just won't go up as much as they would have. Not that they'll go down, but that they won't go up as much as they might have. And that's a really hard argument to make. And that's the argument they've made in the budget context as well. Because when people hear a political argument about bill, electricity bills, they will hear you say they're going down. And during the context of a political election campaign, it, p parties are happy for that to be the impression that, that what they're saying is your bills will be cheaper. That's what people heard. That's what they expect. But then you have to manage those expectations once you've won the election and the pe people are trying to hold you to what they thought was your promise and what you kind of... It was kind of your promise at the time. And now they're trying to say, oh, we just mean mm. it won't be as expensive as it might be otherwise. And, and that's an expectations management exercise and then perhaps, perhaps not succeeding entirely on that front at the moment. Yeah. Yeah, no, I, I think that's right. And 
Yeah, the, the difficulty is, well, the opposition tried to pin the cost of living blame on the government in the Aston by-election, didn't really work there, maybe the other issues no, were I don't, I don't think people are quite blaming the government no, for that yet. But the longer it goes on is the point, yet is the key. Well, they're past it? a yeah. year now, so yeah. I think that, that that challenge will change a little bit now. Yeah. And the government made a big focus of this in the budget, didn't they, around the cost of living pressures and reducing those. So I think mm. uh, what Karen was saying is really clear here, that they're going to be saying, well, they wouldn't, ha they're not going up as much as they might have, but it's, not, it's cold comfort if you're getting a bill and you're deciding whether to heat or eat, that, that's a really crucial thing. People will be saying, well, hold on, why is this? We heard all of this chat during the election campaign that it wasn't, it was actually going to go backwards, now it's not going up as much. Uh, it's going to be hard for that to cut through. I think it is all expectations management. The, uh, uh, perhaps a little movement towards bipartisanship on one element uh, of the budget, that's the change on the petroleum resource rent tax. Uh, the, the opposition leader has said he's open to looking at this now as long as regulation is relaxed on the gas companies. Um, that's not defined as to what that will look like, um, but it sounds like they might be able to move towards a deal. Cutting red tape always sounds easy. It's not necessarily, though, is it, when we're talking about big gas projects? No, it's, it's definitely not. Uh, you know, I mean, I think that um, they'll come to a deal here because the increase in, in that tax was less than, than the Greens had wanted, for example. Yeah. Uh, and, you know, I mean, I think that... And the gas company has effectively sanctioned it. So I think it's, it's not that hard to reach a compromise deal here. And the politics of this, of course, is that the coalition is now trying to deal itself in. The government has been not doing deals with the coalition in the Senate to get legislation through. They've been going to the crossbench and, and the Greens as part of that. And now the coalition is trying to deal itself back in. And I think what you saw in the opposition leader's budget reply was he went out of his way to, to nominate the things that they would support in the government's budget. So maybe they are a bit stung by the old no coalition tag that they're always blocking everything and they're trying to now position themselves as reasonable and sometimes willing to negotiate and to give themselves a bit more leverage, which they haven't had and they won't have if the government can constantly go to other parties. Now, the PwC um, outrage, we've seen government departments really toughen their position during the week. Treasury referred this tax leak scandal to the federal police. Finance said to all government departments, if you're issuing contracts, you've got to bear in mind, what was it, the past practice and ethical behaviour of the company you're awarding a contract to? Outside of the contracts themselves. Yeah, yeah. in other words, a, a, an effective ban, I suppose, on PwC for now, while this is all still being investigated. There was an interesting comment, too, from the head of Home Affairs, Mike Pizzullo, about whether this might end up before the Anti-Corruption Commission that's about to begin. As far as I'm concerned, uh, the advent of the NAC could not have come too soon. We have to throw the anti-corruption well, integrity net much more widely um, to get through into the full supply chain of people who deal with the Commonwealth. Uh, and if this is a salutary example, albeit from some years ago, as to why you need that broader anti-corruption framework, well, this is a good right, example well, of it. That's for the NAC to decide independently, but Karen, for the government's part, have they taken appropriate action so far? Well, I think that they've taken some action, but the broader point that, that Mike Pizzullo was making is quite interesting. He did note that he was concerned that there were no red flags, that this leak had even occurred and that it took some a long time for it to emerge. And, uh, you know, it's, it's puzzling to me why there wasn't something in the system that indicated that some information may have leaked in the behaviour, say, of the big companies. They restructured their arrangements instantly to avoid this new tax. But nobody was cross-checking and saying, well, hang on a minute, yeah, these companies we're going yeah, after are not being caught. Yeah. What is that? Oh, who were they? Whose clients were they? That didn't occur. Yeah. And, in fact, the Finance Department Secretary Jenny Wilkinson said this week that it wasn't until January when the financial reviews Neil Chenoweth wrote about this that they were aware that there mm. was a problem. Then it wasn't until the 2nd of May when the emails were tabled that they realised it was more than one person involved because the company had let them believe that it was one. Why did the system not pick this up yeah. and red flag it? And what is it about these confidentiality agreements that people don't think they're, to quote the Greens, don't think they're worth the paper they're written on? They, they do actually, they are supposed to hold corporate um, executives to the same standard and the same, you know, criminal yeah, implications it's, it's... and other implications as Commonwealth public servants, but they're not being taken seriously when they're being signed. So there's a, I think there's a challenge on two fronts in a preventative sense in future. Yeah, and it seemed that the secretary was pretty annoyed that when the department got in touch with PwC, they weren't open. And in fact, I think early on we had a, a, one of the bosses or someone quite senior at PwC saying, nothing to see here. There was yeah. a comment that was made by uh, the Green Senator, Barbara Pocock, that I thought was really interesting about whether we're looking at the 
tip of the iceberg here. So this has come out because of what came out of the, the practitioners, tax practitioners board, which we now are hearing that maybe there were board members that didn't want that to, to get out, which raises a whole lot of other questions. But how far and wide is, this, is there alleged practice that would make Australians raise their eyebrows? And, and this plays into the government's policy to some degree, of course, because they have been arguing to reduce the reliance on consultants, external consultants, and build up the public service. They're just really going to have to put a lot more resources into rebuilding the public, public service, service here because, I mean, you're losing public servants who are going at triple the salary to these firms uh, who are giving the same advice they would otherwise give taxpayers pay for that. I mean, there's a big argument to really to look at the whole structure of the whole system. Look, final one, uh, in case you're under a rock this week, you, you might have missed. Uh, Narendra Modi, the Indian Prime Minister, was in town. And look, it wasn't quite the usual meeting of uh, political leaders. A big, as you can see, a big stadium event. There were hugs, there were cheers. There... Cam, explain to us the hysteria that follows Modi. What's that all about? I cannot possibly explain it. No, it, it's, <laughs> it's, it's, it's wonderfully Indian. It's a fantastic thing. In fact, the last time we saw this was 2014, of course, when he came again. I mean, the Indians really celebrate their, their Prime Ministers, even though he's quite a divisive figure back at home. Uh, you know, it, it was great to see that many people celebrating. It was quite a positive thing. Diplomacy would be much more interesting if this happened more often. Look, there's plenty of upside. In, <laughs> yeah, plenty of upside you can see for Australia economically, strategically with India. We know there are concerns, though, too, about democratic principles in India. And is is, is the PM Albanese leaning in too uh, too much on this relationship, Karen? People pointing out his tie was the colour of the BJP yeah, party. Yeah, I don't know so. whether that was deliberate or not. I do know he likes orange and he wears that tie a lot and right. his website has been Coincidence. Orange. He's a big fan of orange. Maybe it's coincidence, maybe it's plausible deniability. I don't know. Um, the the, you know, the thing is you, you need to manage a relationship like this carefully. You need it if you're trying to develop a relationship. You've got to pick your time when you're going to raise difficult issues like human rights. But I think ultimately you do have to raise them. So you've got to do it. You may not do it in public. You do have to do it in private at some point. And you've got to judge whether it's going to be damaging to your relationship to do that. So there is an obligation in developing these relationships to make sure that we're Trend sticking care. to our own yeah, values, exactly. value set. And in terms of rallies, in this country, rallies are generally protest. <laughs> in, in that country, they're adulation. I and I think yeah. that's, I that's a bit of the difference. I can't think of any Australian politician. It looks kind politician. of awkward yeah, when yeah, an Australian that, politician exactly. takes the stage in exactly. that context. All right, our panel, Dan Borsha, Karen Middleton and Cameron Stewart, will be back shortly with some final observations. Time now for Mike Bowers and Talking Pictures. I'm Mike Bowers and I'm photographer at large for The Guardian Australia. I'm talking pictures this morning with cartoonists for The Guardian and The Echidna, the one and only Fiona Katowskis. Good morning, the one and only Mike Bowers. Fiona, the Quad might have cancelled its visit, but the Prime Minister of India was happy to do a one-man show. And what a show it was I as know, well. It was really like, it was a strange international visit. Yeah. The Prime Minister, Anthony Albanese, busted out the big views for him. What do you think they're saying? There's a long way from where I came yeah, from. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, look. If you squint, you can see public housing. Mm. The arena show at, um, at Olympic Park was an extraordinary event. It did look like a rock gig. Yeah. yeah. The thing is, just out of view, you can't see the great big neon signs that say, don't mention the human rights abuses. Yeah, 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 yeah. But they make great photos, but it is a dangerous thing for Anthony Albanese to be aligning himself this closely with someone um, in this way, you don't usually see this kind of displays of affection. There was a lot of hugging and also this is going to a domestic Indian audience too, to boost Modi's uh, credibility. So I think you've got to be careful about how you present yourself I think there. the look on his face here says it all. Hope this doesn't backfire. <laughs> um, I did love this David Rowe cartoon, the Camperdown Chariot. Welcome to Narendra Modi. And they're channelling the chariot that they got on when they were visiting India just a few months back. Yeah, but Australian style. Yeah. Did you know I grew up around here? Here. But see, these people aren't, they're not actually Modi fans, they're people who can't afford housing anymore. Yeah, I did love Penny Wong the driver here, sigh. <laughs> With David Rowe, it's always in the details. It's, it's not the devil in the details, it's the gold in the details, isn't it? Fiona, when it comes to The Voice, Peter Dutton's always been vocal, but this week he was really upping the ante. Yeah, he absolutely was, and he loves that anti spelled A N T I as well. Yeah. Lovely Matt Golding. Uh, he, Peter Dutton's wearing a Make the Voice History t shirt. Make history, The Voice. It was interesting to see, um, you know, Dutton saying, the voice is divisive. Yeah. Oops, sorry, that should be, my voice is divisive. <laughs> 
This is a really uh, quite a sharp cartoon, putting the past behind him. He's got Fear the Voice uh, here as it's shed its skin, which was stolen generation, apology, walk out, African gangs, Nauru files. They're trying to divide us by race. New skins and same old snake, I think, is uh, the message here. Yeah, yeah. David Rowe is uh, no less sabre sharp here. The Voice, PD and the Morrison All-Stars. They tried to, to put, put me in political rehab, rehab and I said no, no, no. Well, that is literally preaching to the choir there, isn't yeah, it? Yeah, it really is. There's been some root and branch reform this week as the Victorian government put a stop on logging of native forests. It's uh, unfortunately not until 2030, um, but it is some good news. Yeah, and you've got the koala here who's fallen out of the tree reading the Bush Telegraph, Vic to stop logging in native forests. We thought she'd had a heart attack, but it was just shock at finding some good news about the environment. Yeah, I don't think they're quite out of the woods yet, are no, they? No, they're not out of the woods, but and it is a weird feeling being a cartoonist and going, I just want to do something positive. It was, it was nice to embrace some kind of positivity. With Stan Grant stepping back from the ABC, it's clear both mainstream media and social media has some really hard thinking to do on race. Absolutely, and uh, hopefully that expands to all of us having a bit of reflection because we've all got a role to play in this. You've picked up on this with um, Stan being buried in a sea of sewerage mm. here with the Daily Rage and the Daily Dungeon. Yeah, and we have one of the innocent bystanders here saying, I don't know why Stan Grant doesn't just ignore it, yeah. which is a comment I actually kept seeing. And, like, it's hard to get or get over it and it's kind of hard to get over something when you're... Under when you're buried a lot under of him. that. And uh, here he is uh, in the what looks like a Lysagis jail mm. and he's walking away from it. So all power to Stan. I hope we see him back soon. <laughs> Fiona, it's been a great pleasure on picking events this week. I'll let you do the honours. Thanks, Mike, and it's back to you, David. Thank you, Fiona. Thank you, Mike. Let's get some final observations. Cam. I think um, after many years, things might be happening in the long-running campaign to free Julian Assange. Yeah. Uh, Peter Dutton has um, put his voice to saying it's too long, he should come out. That's a bipartisan position from the government. Stephen Smith, the Australian ambassador in London, recently visited him in jail. We've had a bipartisan delegation from the parliament meeting with um, Caroline Kennedy, the US ambassador, and uh, Anthony Albanese is going to Washington on a state visit later this year. Mm. So I'd say watch this space. I think a David Hicks style deal could be possible. We'll see. Karen. Just on further on the tie, I think you do have to be careful about the messages you send with small choices. So that's what I would add. I just quickly want to note the prevalence um, or the increase online, in, particularly on Twitter, of accounts that are being des described as parody accounts when actually they're just impersonating someone and spreading what is what is really disinformation. There was one about Peter Dutton from purporting to be from Peter Dutton a year or so ago. There's one just popped up now from Anthony Albanese. Uh, it's got a link to an extremist US conspiracy theory mm. website. And it's really just, it's not funny. It's not a parody in any sense. So it's being used as a cover mm. when it's not a parody. It's just spreading disinformation. disinformation. At what point does it become foreign interference and need to be investigated both by the carrier and by our agencies? Point. Dan. We're having really big conversations right now. One of those is about the perspective and wisdom of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander elders. Shameless plug, I've got a show, One Plus One, coming up later in the week where I sit down on country with elders to hear about their life, their perspective, their journey and vision, uh, and also their, their views on the voice. And there is yes, no, and, and those that are unsure in the middle. Uh, and it's, it's really, uh, I'm so grateful for the elders for welcoming us onto their land. Looking forward to watching it. Thank you all very much for joining us this morning, finally. And I'd like to express our deep appreciation and respect for our Gen Z viewers before showing you this. The Federal Police Commissioner sharing some data he'd picked up at a seminar on how to keep young staff happy. We'll leave you with that. Thanks for watching. We learnt too that Gen Z, um, the younger generation, need three times a week praise from their supervisors. Um, the next generation only need three times a year and my generation only need once a year. Senators, um, Senators need more than that. <laughs> <laughs> so it sort of gives you an idea. And then I saw some emojis that Gen Z used that you, is actually offensive, uh, but we, we, my generation are sending these emojis. So it's, uh, the world's changing, I guess, is what I'm saying. In a, sorry? Uh, no, you know, like a happy face. That can actually mean the opposite um, in Gen Z land. Uh, happy to give you a briefing on that. But, um... You're making us all feel very excited about being here. <laughs>